Okay, seeing as we've actually got like, oh, I should wait for Denise to get in. Um, okay, seeing as we've got like a bunch, there's a few sort of new people who've wandered in. I might just explain the, let's call it format we've been working with. So basically it's kind of working in a sort of talky sort of structure. So I will, because of the numbers. So basically I'm going to spend 45 minutes basically kind of talking over the paper, giving some background and then having some random opinions about it. Um, and then there'll be sort of a five minute break and then um, we'll have a discussion about it. So um, people will ask me questions and stuff. Um, and then in two days, we'll come back, we'll bring Max in and we'll um, do more or less do the same thing where the first half will be me interviewing Max basically. And then the second half will be you all asking Max questions while I chair. Um, so that's kind of the, the structure of how this is gonna go for those of you who are new. Um, welcome, um, I'm just gonna make my PowerPoint go. Um, this is going to be um, a bit of a wild ride today, in part because um, this is at the same time a super, super inside baseball paper, right? It's Max telling Adrian that Adrian's sort of kind of wrong, which is very inside baseball. But it's also picking up on these issues, which if you're a philosopher of science, are these like great big issues about the nature of explanation and so on and so forth, which um, is going to mean that some of it is going to make very little sense to those of you who aren't philosophers of science because why do they talk about explanation in these weird ways and so i'm kind of hoping that even if um this seems like a sort of small little debate back and forth between uh, me and max it's going to bring up a whole bunch of really interesting issues about the sort of nature of explanation and how explanation fits into various sciences so um, as I said, explanation is this really big issue. It's such a big issue that I'm not just going to give you background, I'm going to give you background to the background. So I'm going to start with some background to the background. Um, and so this is going to be a very casual walk through some stuff in the philosophy of explanation, which will hopefully, for those of you who aren't familiar with this, give you at least a little bit of the sort of landscape. So ex explanation is something that philosophers just kind of obsess over. And I think one of the reasons why it's good, a thing that philosophers like obsessing over is that you don't need to do much to get the, you know, you don't need to go very far to get the confusion. Here's one way of doing it. What's different between describing something and explaining something? <laughs> What's different between someone answering a question of the form, what is this? And the form, why is this? It seems like there's a difference between me just listing a group of events and me giving you an explanation. And there's a wide variety of different accounts of explanation that philosophers have given, which to some extent can be understood as a way of trying to distinguish between a what question and a why question, right? Um, a classic one in the philosophy of science, which is going on in the background in a sense of my work on this, is the appeal to laws. Something you might say is that, look, the difference between just saying what happened and saying why something happened is that when I tell you why something happened, I tell you why it had to happen. I say, you know, the way that um, an explanation works in science, at least the claim might be, is what you do is you give me um, a what, right? Here's a thing that happened. And what I then do is give you a set of initial conditions and I then give you a law and show that that thing had to happen given that those initial conditions and giving those laws. Um, there are sort of more or less casual versions of this sort of approach. One, one thing you might say is what an explanation does is it shows why the thing that happened was probable. It gives you a set of causes in virtue of which that thing is more likely to happen. Um, that's another kind of account you might have, and you might use a notion of causation to do that. You might just use notions of probability. And for those of you who have seen any philosophy at all, um, even if you're not familiar with this, perhaps you can already imagine the reams and reams of paper that philosophers have spent trying to make sense of this stuff. And um, one that I quite like is, uh, which is a lot more pragmatic, is the idea that the difference between a what and a why is that a what just says this thing, whereas a why tells you this thing as opposed to this other thing. Right. This is the idea that what an explanation is, is it shows you, tells you why something happened as opposed to another thing. So there's a whole sort of huge laundry list of things we might have on the table when we're trying to understand what an explanation is. Um, I take it we can all agree, um, hopefully, maybe people won't later on, which would be fun, um, that what scientists, at least sometimes in the business of doing, is giving explanations. Now, this suggests that we should go and look at the things that scientists say, and we should be able to use that to understand what scientific explanations are like. 
So these very sort of standard old school, you might say, accounts of um, uh, scientific explanation that appeals to laws look weird sometimes when we think about the sort of explanations we see historical scientists give. So um, I think we've spoken a little bit before about Koch's law, the idea that individuals in a lineage increase in size of evolutionary time. Um, uh, the classic case being the ponies here. Here we've got a kind of bunch of different sort of watts and all these watts point at a bunch of whys, right? We have this idea on the sort of extreme left of your screen there. You've got a sort of phylogeny. You've got the various, you know, horses doing their evolutionary business. Next to that, you've got a sort of developmental sequence. We've got an evolutionary sequence as their sort of hoofs change. And then you've got on the right, the ponies themselves. What we're here interested in is the differences in uh, size over time. This seems to be describing a kind of historical trajectory, what some people might sometimes be tempted to call a narrative. And this seems to have a very different um, kind of structure than the sort of explanation that appeals to laws. It doesn't seem like on the face of it that I'm appealing to a law when I tell you here is what happened when the horses evolved, yet it still seems as if I'm giving some kind of explanation. Um, and so there's been a big discussion in the philosophy of history um, that have been trying to say that Although there are law-based explanations, there are also narrative explanations. The original law-based explanation person, Hempel, um, has this idea that what a narrative is, is an explanation sketch. It's not really a full explanation. It's not a proper explanation yet. It merely points to one. The proper explanation will have laws in it. So that's just an example of going, hey, here's an explanation that doesn't look like it has laws. The answer is, ah, well, it's not a proper explanation. Most other people have tried to say, no, no, actually, narratives have a particular explanatory form. They are different than these law-based explanations. William Dre famously has this notion of a sort of how possibly explanation. So what a, um, um, a narrative explanation does for someone like Dre is it doesn't tell you um, uh, how something had to happen. It doesn't give you the... Um, um, uh, the laws that make it necessary that you have that outcome. What they rather do is they show how something could happen where you previously thought that it was impossible. This is the notion of something being how possibly. Um, Collingwood has this sort of idea, at least in, the, in history, that you're not giving kind of causal explanations in history because you're referring to sort of psychological properties. So Collingwood has this model of historical knowledge, which is about us as intentional agents, um, kind of simulating what it would have been like to make the decisions of actors in the past. And that's supposed to be non-scientific. Um, the philosopher of biology, David Hull, has this nice idea of a sort of central subject. So one way of thinking about it is if you were to um, write Adrian's autobiography, that's going to have a unity to it. There's going to be something consistent in that um, story. Um, what's going to make it consistent? Well, it's not that there's a set of laws about Adrian. It's rather there's an individual, there's a subject of that, um, of that story, just as there's a subject of this you know the evolution of horses and so the thing that gives it its explanatory unity as opposed to it being laws is instead the existence of a central subject um very famously sorry i'm just giving you a laundry list here um again this is just to give you a sort of sense of the space um danto and the philosophy of history had this idea that the way that um historical explanations work is they're fundamentally built on sort of narrative sentences and what a narrative sentence does is it kind of defines a thing in the past in terms of things in the future so if you were to say something like um uh, what's a good example i should have thought of an example before i launched into this um you know uh world war ii began in 1945 uh, no, 1939, I am bad at things. Um, what you're doing there is you're pointing at an event that stretched across time that goes on from 1939 to 1945, um, yet uh, you are um, that pointing to a particular point in time, 1939. And there's supposed to be a kind of strange um, um, holistic effect you get when you're making those kinds of explanations. And something that will come up a lot um, is also this sort of notion of contingency. Something that seems to really drive historical explanations um, is the fact that history is messy and fragile and contingent, and it doesn't look like the sort of thing that you can appeal to general universal laws to understand. For those of you who um, um, are more au fait with the philosophy of explanation, something which is an extremely odd 
thing to um, contemporary philosophers of science about the way that narrative explanations are often talked about is there's often this contrast between explanations with laws and explanations without laws and philosophers of science have become a lot more sophisticated with how we think about laws in a way that often isn't reflected in the way that people talk about narrative explanations so it's got a kind of um old timey flavor to it um so one thing that philosophers care a lot about is explanation <laughs> narrative explanation is one of the things they puzzle over Another thing they puzzle over uh, is appeals to um, uh, certain features of explanation and those and how those might be linked to evidence. And a very common way of sort of pointing this out is to sort of quote a whole bunch of scientists. I'm just going to quote one of them. Scientists, particularly physicists, really enjoy appealing to the sort of elegance or the simplicity um, um, or the, you know, the, the, the loveliness of the um, hypotheses they're interested in. And they seem to think that these apparently maybe aesthetic or maybe sort of explanatory as opposed to evidential properties give us some reason to think the theory might be true. So as Teller says, David Teller, you'll be unsurprised to hear as a theoretical physicist, the main purpose of science is simplicity. And as we understand more things, everything is becoming simpler. This is this very um, common idea in physics that, well, amongst theoretical physicists, I should say, that um, there's a sense in which we're going to have a sort of relatively understandable, not by me, um, equation or set of equations that they think are going to capture all of these um, fundamental processes in this way, which in some way is simple and somehow that's good, right? And so scientists appeal to virtues of explanations, things that make explanations work or feel good or something over and above the kind of empirical virtues, right? It's not just that this explanation captures the evidence well, it also is more simple than the other explanation is the most common example of this. And so there's a kind of question, I like the way Peter Lipton put this, what is the connection between the likeliness of a theory, right, whether it's true or not, and its loveliness, which is to say, um, you know, its elegance or its simplicity or its cogency and so on and so forth. And so there's a huge debate in 20th century philosophy of science where people are asking that kind of question. So I've just sketched two big questions. The first is basically, what is an explanation? What is the structure of an explanation? The second is, what is the relationship between explanation and if you want truth or evidence or data you know don't truth doesn't need to be uh, have a capital t there um and those are sort of two big questions that were asked a lot during the 20th century philosophy of science and that's playing a sort of background to the way that people like myself um, and also various other currently working philosophers of science, people like Derek Turner, Mark Arashevsky, Derek, um, uh, uh, John Beatty, are sort of trying to think about when we think about um, the way that explanations work in historical science. A final bit of background to the background is one thing that I haven't emphasized when I've talked about Carol's view of historical science is this idea that there's a kind of, there's an implied sequence of events here, right? There's this idea that when you're doing sort of paradigmatic historical science, what you do is you notice a bunch of traces, you do some field work, you see some traces, you then generate a bunch of hypotheses, right? And then you go searching for smoking guns. It suggests a kind of historical sequence. Now, of course, this is highly idealized in lots of ways. So it's a bit unclear how seriously we should take it as a sort of hypothesis. But on the face of it, it seems to be giving us a certain sort of picture in terms of how we should expect historical investigation to proceed. You start by finding surprising correlations, or as we'll call it um, following Max, characterizing the phenomena. You then have a process of generating hypotheses. Then we have a process of whittling down the hypotheses. And so the work that I've done on the nature of historical explanation that Max is responding to is really starting from these sorts of two thoughts. One is the thought that um, it does seem to me that there's a form of explanation that we see in history, which looks different to the kinds of explanations that I see in other parts of science. Um, need to be, I mean, what I mean by historical science, what I mean by other parts of science, I'm actually not too clear on, but I think at least there's a distinction to be drawn between two explanatory forms. And so that's asking the explanation question. And also I think that the kinds of, um, 
uh, progressions we see in the way that historical explanation proceeds, the way that it changes over time, the dynamics, as Max really nicely calls it, of explanation is um, different than you'd expect if you read Cleland at least naively. So let's move from the background to the background to the background. I'm impressed that I did that in 10, 12 minutes or so. <laughs> so here are some meerkats. Meerkats, they live in Africa. Here is a fossa. Um, those of you who haven't seen a fossa before, if you've seen the um, uh, film, the cartoon Madagascar, um, the bad guys in the first Madagascar are fossa. Fossa um, are, um, including their tail, up to about six feet long. They're actually pretty big, uh, and they eat lemurs. Um, so, and meerkats and fossa are very closely related to each other. So there's a question, how come on Africa you have things like meerkats and weasels and such like, whereas in Madagascar you have fossa? who are much, much bigger. Why are they so much bigger? Well, an island biogeographer will come to you and say, oh, it's very straightforward. On islands, you have founder effects. So who turns up on the island can be a little bit random. Islands have got really different sort of niche spaces than you see on mainlands, on continents. Um, and this means that you get, you know, founder populations showing up, a bunch of weasel-like things showed up in Madagascar. And because there was more open niche space, they then evolved into these sort of large predator niche in order to um, uh, eat the lemurs <laughs> that were sort of hanging around, not being eaten at the time, is the rough idea. And what they'll then do is point to other cases of island gigantism. They'll point to giant parrots and birds in New Zealand. They'll point to, um, uh, you know, dodos and other giant birds and various islands um, and so on and so forth. Notice that the form of the explanation here is you say, how come big thing on island and island biogeography says, here's a fairly simple little model and we can just fit that into the model. We can compare that type of explanation. What I'm doing here, by the way, is giving you a sort of simple case that's going to motivate the view that Max is responding to, which is why it's still background. Compare that to the way that people explain the size of sauropods. Um, here are a bunch of sauropod dinosaurs. Sauropod dinosaurs are obnoxiously large. So um, the biggest terrestrial animals are by and far away, these guys. They are um, something in the vicinity of sort of 20 to 25 tons, um, maybe. It's kind of hard to tell. Um, but lengthwise, they're getting up to about sort of 30 meters. The best that um, uh, mammals can manage on land is Parasitherium, um, who's about uh, 12 meters long. Um, so big difference in length and actually quite significant differences in weight as well. Um, how do you explain that? Well, the explanation does not look like the fossa explanation. What paleontologists don't do is go, hey, here's a little model, um, here's how they fit into it. What they do instead is they go, here's a bunch of stuff about sauropods. Um, I've not talked about this for a long time. Off the top of my head, here are some of the things that seem to matter. You've got a bunch of primitive features of sauropods. One of those is being oviparous, laying eggs. Laying eggs is really important if you're big, because if you're big, you're not going to have very many adults um, because of environmental constraints. If you don't have um, very many adults, if you've got a small adult population, that makes that population quite vulnerable. But, you know, if you have just a disease comes through, that could wipe everyone out. Um, but happily, because you can just lay a whole bunch of eggs and because it's relatively easy to raise things from eggs, that means you can replace adult populations pretty easily compared to live birth. So that's a difference in kind of population dynamics that come from laying eggs. Another really important thing of the sort of early sauropods when they were all little was they had this very particular long neck sort of structure. Having that long neck enables you to sort of maximize how much food you take in, um, irrelevant to um, 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 how much energy you use because you can just sit there and move your neck around. Um, they don't masticate, so they don't chew. Not chewing is really, really important if you want to eat a lot of food. If you're a dumb mammal like us, where you care a lot about your jaw and your teeth, this means that you have to sit there very boringly chewing your food, and that decreases how much food you take in. Um, so not chewing is very important. It also lets you have that little head on the end of a long neck. Um, they also have some sort of interesting tricks with the sort of um, basal metabolic rates that seem to have been sort of changed and so on and so forth. Um, you get the idea. Here's Santa Christian et al. trying to summarize their explanation <laughs> very roughly. You have a bunch of primitive stuff, then you have a bunch of derived stuff. Um, and there's a bunch of external triggers like theropods starting to get bigger and eating you um, and a bunch of internal triggers like basically the relationship between having 
um, not chewing and having to digest a lot and having a bigger body. Um, and this gives you this extremely specific set of complicated bits of information that's required to get from a kind of basal primitive sauropod to your 30 meter long giant. So I think that that description is really, really different. That's a really different explanation than the type we get with the fossa. And the way I try and capture this very basically, I'm going to go into more detail if I have time at the end, is um, in terms of what I call a simple versus a complex narrative explanation. A simple um, narrative explanation is going to have um, low detail and it's going to be embedded. What does that mean? Um, very basically, by embedded, I mean that something is enfolded, incorporated into a model. When I explained fossil gigantism, what I did was I said, here's island gigantism. Here's how island gigantism works. Here's why the fossa is a token of that type. Here's why the fossa is something which fits within that model. Um, a detail is basically about how much you need to say, how, many, how, much, how much you need to know in order for the explanation to do its work. Um, in the fossa case, I kind of just need to say, whoops, I kind of just need to say, hey, one of these things would have turned up on the island, here's the dynamics, and that's going to give it to you. Whereas when I'm talking about the sauropod case, there isn't a model, there's a huge number of different models that I'm having to use. I'm not embedding it in a single set of dynamics, I'm emb embedding it in many dynamics, and I need to have a whole bunch of detail. And the basic move that I make in this paper back in 2014 is I say, look, there's a difference between uh, these narrative explanations that are simple and the narrative explanations that are complex. Um, what is the difference? Well, the difference is basically that those simple narrative explanations, I think, look the same and work in roughly the same way as law-based explanations, or in this case, sort of mechanistic explanations. Um, whereas the complex ones don't. The complex ones seem to be a bit different. I also think that this distinction, when you look at the way that historical um, investigation proceeds, actually shows that that naive reading of, um, of uh, uh, Carroll's view can't be quite right, because we don't see, I don't think, the shift from characterizing the phenomena to generating hypotheses to whittling them down. It rather looks more like this. Often you have a bunch of simple narratives that get generated. Then there is some sort of as a period of time where some are smoking gunned, as it were, some don't manage to get into um, empirical tests. But then downstream, those that have survived tend to be synthesized, they tend to start going, well, I guess we'll take elements of all of these different narratives. And that's how they construct a kind of complex narrative. And so the basic claims in this paper that Max is responding to, as I say, simple narratives are similar to mechanistic and law like explanations. So those philosophers who know about the philosophy of science in the room might be cringing as I throw together mechanistic and more like explanations. Very happy to fight about that in questions. Um, but I think complex narratives really resist being explained the way that a sort of mechanistic or a law like explanation might work. They're too contingent. They involve multiple systems across many different time scales. So they are a really different type of explanation. Um, I've got this claim about the way that historical science unfolds, the way that the explanations develop, which is they go from simple to complex. And crucially, I think this reflects the way the world is. The idea is something like this. The world that the historical scientists are interested in is complex and obstinate um, and refuses to be simple um, and refuses to allow, in a sense, simple explanations. Um, um, and so this movement from simple to complex is a, a progression. Uh, it's, the science is getting better in virtue of that. It's reflecting the world um, in a better way, I guess is one way of putting it. And I take it that something that's supposed to be a little bit interesting about this is think about what that physicist was saying, you know, 10, 15 minutes ago, they were saying science proceeds to simplicity. Science unifies and things like that. Whereas here I'm saying, no, it doesn't. At least in these instances, science doesn't move towards unification. Science moves towards messiness and disunity. Which finally gets us past background which I'm very impressed with, given that I've been talking for 24, 25 minutes or so. Your brains must be very tired. I'm sorry about my pace, but whatever, it's a fun time. So <laughs> Max comes in and Max wants to say that I, he, he's, he's willing to say, all right, you've got the explanatory pattern, okay, but there's this really crucial thing that I'm not talking about, which is why we see this pattern. And I take it one of the things that's really important for Max 
is that I'm making a mistake that philosophers make all the time. You can tell he's really annoyed about this, which is that I'm just obsessed with explanation. And so I'm always going on and on about explanation, which means I'm missing where all the action is, right? Um, he wants to say that the shift from simplicity to complexity is driven by non-explanatory aims, in particular, how we characterize the phenomena. So the rough idea is this, as we come to know more about a particular phenomenon, we sometimes get more empirical constraints that an explanation needs to meet, and therefore the explanation comes more complex. And so where my story looks like I'm saying, oh, you're moving forward by testing explanatory hypotheses, Max says, no, what's actually going on is we're learning more about the phenomena, and that's constraining our explanatory hypothesis. As Max says, I'm less satisfied with Adrian's observa observations regarding explanatory dynamics. The reason is the central place they award to the formulation and testing of explanatory hypotheses or narratives and their consequent neglect of non-explanatory work, work that may be relevant to the evaluation of explanatory hypotheses, but that is not undertaken in the interest of testing particular explanatory claims. And he gives us a case study, and I'm going to talk about it very, very casually, um, but the case study is the sort of the big one when we talk about mass extinction. So here's a bunch of um, here's, here's time. <laughs> here's a whole bunch of time. Um, where we're located is right there at the end of the Permian, where you just have this kind of wild decrease in biodiversity. You see a huge plunge in biodiversity. And as Max really beautifully tells the story in this paper, like I think he does just a brilliant job of capturing all of these really interesting hypotheses, but also crucially, you know, for someone who like loves watching science develop, the way that he captures the history, I think is both um uh, uh easy it's, it's both easy to digest um and also um yeah just fascinating uh in the 1970s we have what i would think to be a classic simple narrative explanation it goes like this why did so many things go extinct at the end of the permian well the answer is pangaea for the first time in a long time all the continents come together and have a big hug um what happens when all the continents have a big hug well two things First thing that decreases the water level because all the basically the land is squishing together and rising and so the water level on the land is going down and also because you have these huge areas of um, uh, sealess land that gives you increased variability in temperature in land and that's going to increase your aridity. And these classically are in a positive feedback loop, which is to say um, you're going to get runaway. Um, decrease of water because as you increase aridity unsurprisingly that decreases the amount of water but also as the water goes down that increases the aridity what's the upshot well the shallow water habitats all die and back in the 1970s they thought that the mass extinction was largely hitting those shallow water habitats and so this is very much a sort of simple explanation, right? You've got a single trigger, which is Pangaea forming. You've got a very simple dynamic, which is the relationship between aridity and water level. And that's going to give you the effect. So you can imagine someone happily giving a sort of um, law-based explanation of this. Into the 1990s, things get significantly and annoyingly more complicated. Um, uh, basically, we learn more and more and more about the timing and about various other features. And we end up getting to the point where we say, well, maybe it was just a whole bunch of stuff sort of happening more, not even in this case, not even at the same time. So this is what's often called the murder on the Orient, well, was named the murder on the Orient Express kind of model. And that model um, says something like you have over a period of three or four million years, you have a whole bunch of weird events, you've got volcanoes going off, you've got a whole bunch of really interesting sort of chemical events that aren't necessarily related to those, and all of these together lead to the sort of extinction arriving. And so this was a sort of maximally sort of disunified kind of picture. There is no one trigger, you need a sort of perfect storm of things happening at the same time. As Max puts it, in addition to regression and increased seasonality, we now have volcanoes pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, marine anoxia, and the release of methane gas hydrates from deep ocean reservoir. These new processes are not overkill, as he says. They're not, they're, they arose from, the, from particular demands, sorry, typo, of the evidential situation, and we needed to explain all pertinent evidence. So this is really crucial for sort of Max's story. What's going on is they're not going, oh, we need to test all of these explanatory hypotheses. What they're rather doing is learning more 
about that time. Someone goes and does a study of the Permian and goes, oh, look, it turns out that there are lots of volcanoes at the time. Gosh, seems as if that should be something that should be incorporated into our explanation. Um, by the 2020s, uh, we have um, sort of everyone's gone on to the eruptions, right? So there's kind of the, ever, there seems to be a kind of consensus of sorts, which is formed around the Siberian Traps, which is basically the largest um, recorded period of volcanism. Um, uh, and that seems to have been a real trigger. And to an extent now, um, quite a few people who look at mass extinctions have a tendency to think that many of them were really triggered by volcanic activity. Um, in fact, to some extent, um, it's now thought that the, the dinosaur exchange in the KPG is um, partly to blame, um, is, is, sorry, the KPG extinction is weird because it seems to have been less caused by volcanoes than the other extinctions. Um, okay, and so as he says, the recent consensus on the explanation of the end Permian is not significantly more complicated than the original one. Each posits a single trigger, right? Volcanic outgassing in the formation of Pangaea that sets in train a various of downstream kill mechanisms. The number and variety of enlisted kill mechanisms is probably greater in the new model, yet the overall difference in complexity is a fairly modest one. So crucially, Max thinks he's found a counterexample to my sort of picture of things getting increasingly complex. Here he thinks we've got a case where it goes simple to complex to simple again. Okay, and then we get to the actual sort of uh, meat of the matter. What explains the shift from simple to complex to simple? Well, what he wants to do is distinguish between what I'm going to call explanatory structure and what he calls the sort of characterization of the phenomena. Um, we can sort of imagine these evolving over time. I'm not sure why I have these colors. I just thought they were pretty. Um, but the idea is, as time goes by, you're going to learn more and more different things about your phenomena. And what you know about your phenomena constrains the kinds of explanations that are going to be adequate. And so effectively, the adequacy criteria um, is partly determined by how you characterize your phenomena. And so early on, when you're first learning about your phenomena, you don't have many adequacy criteria because you just don't know very much. As you get more and more knowledge, then you're going to get more and more adequacy criteria. It's going to constrain the explanation increasingly, and the explanation is going to have to get more, more complex to accommodate that increase in uh, phenomenal complexity. So as Max says, early in the career of an investigative project, the features of a target will be poorly characterized. Some features won't be known at all. Since the complexity of an explanatory model tends to reflect the constraints on explanation supplied by ongoing characterization. In other words, the kind of thing I want in my explanation is going to be turned on what I turn on what I get from that characterization. The explanatory models that are formulated during the early stages will tend towards simplicity, right? Um, which is a very different kind of answer than the one that I give about this. As characterization proceeds, as we learn more and more about our phenomena, this gives more constraints on explanation in the form of an expanded roster of adequacy criteria. So researchers then be forced to entertain more complex explanations. And so we this sort of big move, I think, that um, Drizal makes in this paper is the sort of difference between sort of characterizing a phenomena versus testing an explanation. And I think he's right that um, uh, lots of people, not just me, have talked about progress in historical science in terms of testing explanatory hypotheses. So um, I think Max could have expanded his range of targets here beyond um, uh, little old Adrian. Um, Carol Cleland's work on smoking guns is very, very clearly thinking about um, historical science as a hypothesis driven um, um, thing to do and name and also an explanatory project and um, Cleland is very explicit about its explanatory about it being an expl explanation driven process. Derek Turner's work on underdetermination that we've seen again their whole focus is on the capacity for explanatory hypotheses to be confirmed and I think um, I, I, I suspect he's more or less got me sort of bang to rights, although I'll do some whinging in a second, um, about especially the work on speculation, where it's very easy to find me saying things like, you need to have these, you know, bold hypotheses in historical science, because those bold hypotheses allow you to find things to test. And that's really important for um, uh, progress in these sciences. Um, and so I think he's got me pretty bang to rights on that.
Uh, he thinks this is a, this is distorted. He says it's distorted because it implies that most research activities in geohistory are oriented towards explanation, while in fact, most activities aim to generate a better descriptive understanding of a subject domain. Um, so the claim here is, look, when you're a historical scientist of some stripe, particularly if you're a geochronologist or a stratigrapher or these kinds of people, the vast majority of the time, what you're not doing is testing explanatory hypotheses. What you're doing instead is constructing, you know, chronologies of what happened, right? You're applying your tools to reconstruct the past, but not towards any particular type of hypothesis, uh, at least not an explanatory run. Rather, you're trying to characterize a phenomena. And for what it's worth, I think Max certainly isn't wrong about that basic claim. So, what Max has done is given, in a sense, a kind of counterexample to the view that I've taken. But more importantly, what he's done is he said that we ought to uh, uh, take the focus less on explanation when we're thinking about historical science and focus much more on these kind of constructive projects and um, uh, these sort of efforts to characterize the phenomena. Now, I think um, I don't disagree with him on that. I think that that's important, although I do think that it's worth um, noting that um, oh, sorry, putting this. No, I think I'm, I think he's just right <laughs> about that. But I do want to sort of have a quick discussion of three things. Um, and as we'll see, these are um, fairly casual or fairly ambiguous. I'm not sure what to think about these. So first is Max has a bunch of claims about what I say about what I call one shot hypotheses. So for instance, he says that um, this uh, final form, maybe probably not the final form, but the current final form, if you want, of the um, extinction of the uh, of the Permian extinction is a simple um, uh, narrative explanation and a one shot hypothesis. And he thinks that um, this is sort of a Sorry, he thinks it's a complex one-shot hypothesis, and he thinks that this is a uh, mistake on my part. So, as he says, if one-shot hypotheses are not invariably simple, then no special difficulty attaches to their justification in a complex world. Um, so very quickly, I just want to talk through, and this is partly just for getting it clear in my head, what I mean by narrative simplicity and whether or not Max is right. Um, and so, at least more recently, when I've characterized this notion of narrative simplicity, I've sort of provided a little more detail on what I mean by embedded, what I mean by detailed. So when I say embedded, this is this notion that something is, as it were, embedded in a model, right? So you can think about that as being parasitic on theoretical simplicity, right? So theories can be more or less complicated. They can have more variables, they can have more moving parts within them. Um, how complicated that theory is, that body of theory, is going to reflect how complicated your narrative is. By detailed, we can understand that using a notion like sort of difference making. Basically, it's how many moving parts, how many particular things do you need to get? How many causes do you have within the trajectory that you're dealing with? This is kind of what I mean by narrative simplicity. So this explanation here, um, is it very embedded? No, you know, it's not embedded, <laughs> right? Um, there are, there's one trigger, which is the Siberian traps, but there's a vast <laughs> array of different um, causal models that this thing is um, putting together. Is it detailed? It's pretty detailed, right? There's a lot, basically one easy way of thinking about detail is, are there lots of arrows? that has lots of arrows, right? So that counts as complex. That is not a simple narrative, that is a complex narrative. So what do I mean by a one shot? By a one shot hypothesis, I mean that it's a simple narrative, which is treated as being mutually exclusive with other putative hypotheses. So one thing to point out is that just by definitional fiat, um, Drow, uh, uh, Max is wrong to say that there can be complex one shot hypotheses, but definitional fiats are boring, um, it's not a particularly interesting thing to sort of point out. Um, the thing that really matters to me, I think, is whether or not it's treated as mutually exclusive with other putative hypotheses. And I don't think it is. Um, I think it's more got elements of various other hypotheses that have been incorporated into it. And it rather looks like a kind of end product of this process that I kind of describe of shifting from simple to complex. Um, but I'm not entirely sure on that. I think that um, 
uh, whether or not this thing is really being treated as mutually exclusive with other putative hypotheses um, is something that can be debated about. I'm not sure. But I do think that Max is wrong when he says that the recent consensus on the explanation of the impermeant explanation is not significantly more complicated than the original one. Why is, it, why is he wrong? Well, um, if what he means is um, my sense of complicated, then just because they both have one trigger, it doesn't follow from that that once that they're both simple explanations. Um, one of them is significantly more complicated. It's got a lot more detail and it's a lot less embedded. So I'm not sure whether to take the point on one shot hypotheses, but there's a debate to be had. I, am, I think he's wrong in saying that the um, current consensus model is roughly as, simil, as simple as the original one. I do think he's right that in some sense, it's more simple than the, um, the middle one, the 1970s one, um, but we'll see about that. And one thing that I'm not sure how to articulate here is that he's right that both of them involve a single trigger, both the original one, which was the, you know, the forming of Pangaea and the latest one, which is them big volcanoes going off. There's like a one trigger, which sounds very one shot, right? There's this big problem in the philosophy of historical science. You may have already noticed it where people use these very evocative terms like one shot hypotheses and smoking guns, but then what they actually mean by one shot hypothesis and smoking gun actually ends up being quite misleading. It moves away from the metaphor once you look at the actual details of the philosophical view. And I suspect that I'm guilty of this here. Okay, two quick things. Um, part of uh, Max's move is to say that his account is better than mine, or at least is a good addition to mine, because what it does is it goes beyond the mere kinematics, the sort of pattern that we see, and goes to explaining it. And the idea is the explanation is to do with characterization. As he says, uh, oh yes, and what I've always found a bit confusing about this, in a sense, is that I think this coheres with an explanation that I give, which I often sort of have put in terms of ontology. So I'm going to do the embarrassing thing of quoting Adrian from 10 years ago. Um, I should do it in a silly voice. Um, at least in some cases, a choice between utilizing a simple or a complex explanatory strategy is not free, but depends on how the world is. Um, with sauropod gigantism, it seems that simple explanations failed because the thing we're trying to explain is itself diffuse and complex. So we can read the shift from simple to complex as, a, as progress, because in abandoning those simple explanations, we learn that the explanandum, the thing we're trying to explain, is just not appropriately considered part of a general class of events. It's not the kind of thing that I can sort of encapsulate in a model. And we shift to a better explanation of the target. So it's my contention that this pattern is due to historical science taking the complexity of the world seriously. Faced with a messy world, they respond with messy explanations. Now, how different is this than what Max is saying? Well, I'm not entirely sure. So Max says, narratives become more complex as we learn more about the phenomenon. I say, the complexity of the world demands complex narratives. Well, what is it to learn more about a phenomenon if not to learn about the world, right? And so I actually think we're saying something extremely similar here, just in kind of different ways, right? I do think that um, there is a way in which we are very different, which is the difference between sort of characterization and explanation. So I think the explanation we give in terms of why do we go from simple to complex is actually pretty much the same. But the story we have about what drives historical science, I think is very different. My picture does look very hypothesis driven and Max's picture looks more phenomenon driven. And so I thought I would finish, um, whew, yeah, by kind of asking what I should say to Max about this. Um, First off, I think that we're both going to agree that there's no going to there's no universal answer to this, right? Sometimes um, uh, things are going to involve more phenomena characterization. Sometimes things are going to involve a lot more explanation. Um, but I think that there's a bunch of like this distinction between explanatory structure and the characterization of phenomena. I think there's a bunch of things we can do with it. So one thing that's interesting is it seems to take us right back to that what and why, right? when you're characterizing the phenomenon, you're kind of asking what, when you're looking at a characterized a hypothesis um, explanation, you're sort of asking why to some extent. And I think it's kind of interesting that we're going right back to that sort of original question. But I think that Max go, takes things a little bit too far when he says that 
phenomena characterization um, is the thing entirely in the driving seat. Because I think that the explanatory structure, the explanatory goals we have play a huge role in what you might think of as the context to pursuit. When a um, stratigrapher or whoever is writing their grant proposal or explaining what they're doing, they'll do it in terms of a set of explanatory goals. Um, uh, what sorts of things will get published is often in terms of notions of significance, which are really tied to certain explanatory ideas. So I'm sort of really suspicious of this idea that we can pull apart phenomena and characterize uh, phenomena and explanation in this way and just say one's providing adequacy criteria. Um, Max responds to an idea a little bit like this. He says, look, a stratigrapher engaged in correlating boundary sections isn't testing a hypothesis, an explanatory one anyway. She's trying to tell the story, unravel the sequences of formations spanning the boundary. So even if her results may be relevant to the evaluation of an explanatory hypothesis, it seems kind of perverse to describe her as engaged in a test of that hypothesis. I think he's right that it would be weird to say that they were testing the hypothesis. But that's not what I think the relationship is, right? I think the relationship is one of um, 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 the explanatory stuff informing the um, phenomenal stuff. It's shaping and guiding it. And so I think I see the relationship as much more two directional than the kind of one direction that Max has kind of seems to suggest. So put me in a certain mood and I might start worrying about this distinction between descriptive hypotheses and explanatory hypotheses. Hypotheses. I suspect often these things really emerge together. Um, to say that there is influence from the explanatory level to the phenomena level doesn't involve me saying there are tests, right? I just want to say that these explanatory regimes shape how characterization goes. They matter a lot for what gets categorized and how it gets categorized. Here's an extraordinarily annoying way of putting it. How we say what is shaped by the whys we've got in mind, just as the acceptable whys are constrained by the whats. Great. So it might be that we want to say something like this characterizations and explanations, right? Describing what's happening versus explaining what's happening are really useful abstractions sometimes when we're thinking about justifications in science. But I suggest, but I, I suspect that in practice, the two is significantly coupled. And I think this is a sort of useful question, right? I think something that's really interesting that comes out between this discussion between Max and I is that it means that there's sort of a real question here, which is what is in the driving seat in various sort of scientific disputes? As per always, it's not just going to be one thing, it's going to be a range of different things. Um, but I think trying to get a handle on under what conditions different things are in the driving seat, and more importantly, what should be, is a kind of important question. Okay, that was a lot of me talking. Um, that was a lot more than previous weeks have been. Um, I imagine it's going to be interesting to see how sort of questions go. Um, I really want to emphasize for those of you who haven't um, done a huge amount of philosophy, that that was a huge info dump in a lot of ways. And it's a really good idea to practice your, I had no idea what you meant when you said this kind of abilities. But let's take a five minute break, come back at five minutes too, and then we'll spend sort of 35 minutes sort of kicking the ball around. So see you all soon. All right, so as people sort of start coming in, uh, that was definitely the most like Adrian just <laughs> going hard really for a long time with lots of content. One of these sessions, I think in retrospect, probably if we really wanted to cover this, maybe two weeks would have been useful. Um, uh, so I apologize for like how much was in there. Um, but basically the, um, I, I'm going to just say this every time. I don't care. Um, effectively, um, we all, we know zoom, you can, Put something in the chat if you want, even just I want to ask a question, you can use your reaction to raise your hand like so look at that such such fun. Um, or you can um, uh, just start waving your hands around wildly and i'll be able to sort of see you so um, yeah if anyone has any questions use one of those three methods to indicate that you have something to say. Okay, I have to ask a question, can you hear me actually. Yep, I can hear okay. You. So, <clears throat> uh, this uh, distinction between description and the descriptive work and uh, the dynamics or so connection with the dynamics of uh, research and uh, the sort of change of, in, of the main hypothesis, let's say, 
I'm not quite sure. I mean, it's sort of a problem that anybody looking at the dynamics of any scientific research has to think about in a way. So, and I don't think that uh, the situation is much different or the question is very different in, in non-historical sciences. It's, it's actually identical. But what I don't really understand is why, uh, why is this a dilemma, really? Why, uh, g given how different research practices are, how different teams and individuals approach problems, Sometimes we have this sort of a more inductive process that Max is describing from uh, this sort of descriptions or descriptive hypotheses which are sort of local to the phenomena and then you know they accum accumulate and then the sort of master hypothesis slowly changes eventually. Uh, and then sometimes there's dynamics that sort of you are seem to be describing that there is this sometimes sort of conjecture or almost bold hypothesis and then uh, people are testing and learning more and more and then maybe along the way it might turn into what Max is describing. So it seems to me that both of these dynamics are present in various fields. Archaeology is more the way that Max is describing because they accumulate for a number of reasons various uh, evidence you know, just because they have to clean up the sites for museums or whatever. They're not really testing hypotheses all the time, but even in terms of the uh, big extinctions, you know, there's this Alvarez's uh, uh, attempt to explain uh, the extinction of dinosaurs with uh, sort of a asteroid uh, hypothesis, which is much more along the lines that you are advocating than maybe the Sort of Permian is more. So why is this a dilemma? I don't. I mean, we don't really know what's uh, without really sort of looking closely and kind of identifying which strategy is more frequent in various areas. We don't really know who is more right. But it seems to me that it's definitely not a dilemma actually. But that you're sort of just describing two different dynamics. Yeah. I think that's right. I mean, I don't, I didn't take myself to be present. I, I hope I didn't mean to present it as a dilemma. Um, I was presenting extremely fast. So it may have been that I sort of said that uh, a few times. <laughs> they certainly, they're certainly sort of contrasting, um, contrasting models. And it seems like you might, I think there's a bit of the paper where Max kind of uses the term relative frequency. So this could look like a relative frequency debate. So in paleontology, those happen all the time, right? Do you think that this model of speciation happens more often or this model of speciation happens more often? Um, so it may be that um, we're, we're arguing over the sort of dominant um, pattern, but you might think, I think rightly, that that in itself doesn't seem particularly interesting, um, right? Like once you admit that both of them happen and actually both of them happen quite often, you're then like, well, that's cool, fine. I think. One thing to say that I think counts as kind of progress here is that, as basically what you just said, we both articulated these kinds of um, modes, if you want, that sort of scientists go along. So I do think that's kind of, and you might say something similar of, say, sort of um, Carol Cleland's work, right? Although you might not think she's characterized, you know, uh, a very, it's not a very descriptively adequate notion of what um, a lot of historical scientists are in the business of doing. Nonetheless, they're certainly doing that sometimes, and that's really useful to sort of have on the table. Um, but I think there's some more um, interesting things to say here. There's more ways of kind of justifying this discussion, which goes something like this. We're all philosophers in this debate, um, and philosophers like to explain stuff ourselves, right? What we're trying to do is explain um, the patterns we see in scientific research. And um, part of that explanation involves kind of going, here's why science is successful. Here's why it works. Here's how it should be. It's got this normative pres prescriptive element to it. And so once we say, um, oh, here's uh, these two modes of doing stuff, the interesting question then is, when should you do it one way? When should you do it another way? Now, one worry might be that there's no real answer to that question. There's nothing systematic I can say about it. It might end up being, hey, sometimes you've got lots of data, so do the data one. Sometimes you don't, so do it differently, right? But I think the kind of hope is 
that you might be able to say something more. You might downstream be able to say something important about uh, the, what's the way of putting it, um, about under what circumstances you might adopt these different strategies. Um, as you can see, this is, um, we're kind of at the stage of kind of articulating what these strategies are, as opposed to giving a particularly detailed argument for like, when go for one and when go for another. Um, but I think that could be a sort of way of making it interesting. For me, though, the thing that makes it that I really care, the reason I really care about this stuff, besides just being a philosopher, so I've been having had notions of explanation and being important ground into my skull for like over 10 years, um, is I think that these explanatory dynamics um, tell us something really interesting about the way that scientists value things. Um, this phenomenon that I find really, really interesting is the ways in which different scientists make different judgments about what makes a hypothesis good and what makes a hypothesis bad. Um, one of the things I often find really interesting about people like archaeologists and anthropologists and historians is they're trained to like complexity. They have a tendency to think that the complex is going to be more likely to be true, which is really different to the sort of thinking you see in physicists and chemists and people working in experimental contexts, even many biologists, at least lab biologists, have a tendency to strive for simplicity. And I think it's really interesting because philosophers have often sort of take it in as sort of a given that all scientists have similar values in these kinds of ways, like they all like simplicity. And I find it striking that occasionally paleontologists will talk about simplicity being good they'll very occasionally like use the word parsimony um but not in the same way that other scientists do and i don't think i've ever seen an archaeologist use the word parsimony uh, i'm sure the archaeologist can point to point to some cases to me um, but i think one of the things for me that makes this exciting and interesting is that it's telling us something about it's a good way for me of starting to think about the ways in which different scientists have these different values um, in terms of like what they think makes for a good explanation even. And I think that's kind of cool. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I mean, it's really sort of a, uh, goes into sort of social epistemology of science and the way that, yeah, these uh, kind of motivations and like various ways of, yeah. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> I justified myself. Yeah, I'm not, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was sort of anticipating after um, yesterday, uh, last week's kind of pile in on the um, uh, the thinking about data one. When I was reading this paper today, I was like, oh, this is going to be trickier from a sort of uh, discussion standpoint. I mean, something I am really interested in hearing is, um, you know, one of the sort of questions I'm really interested in hearing from the archaeologists in terms of to what extent you see your work as kind of driven by sort of explanatory concerns or to what extent you see it driven by kind of more descriptive concerns. Because for instance, um, earlier, um, we just had the claim that archaeology usually is more on the characterizing front. And it's interesting because I uh, kind of don't think that, <laughs> or at least I didn't immediately think that. And so I'm quite interested in hearing from archaeologists on that, like an, an archaeologist like Alexander, for instance. Yes, thank you. Well, uh, <clears throat> I just, uh happened to see uh, on one of your slides, a rather important uh, figure in the history of archeological thought, although he's a, a philosopher of science, that's Hempel. And it's uh, very close, he, he was very closely related with explanations in archeology span and great revolution that happened in archeological theory in the uh, 60s. And that is uh, moving from so-called descriptive uh, uh, cultural historical archaeology to uh, processual or uh, new archaeology based on uh, logical positivism. So uh, this kind of explanations, uh, uh, what was at the time revolutionary was something that uh, later and perhaps Tasha and Monica can uh, uh, elaborate on that. Uh, drove uh, archaeological into a new crisis, and uh, because uh, this uh, this kind of uh, explanations, scientific explanations in archaeology, explicitly scientific explanations in archaeology, led to uh, idea that uh, we can make uh, laws uh, in archaeology, mm. and uh, the, uh, this is the well Hempel uh, stuff. So it was, of course, uh, later criticized. So 
we uh, uh, it, things are not that simple. Neither was uh, cultural historical archaeology uh, uh, so simple and descriptive. Uh, it was also theory laden, and uh, especially this word explanation uh, always in archaeology is now related to, to this sort of positivism and was, uh, uh, of course, in post-processual and post-modernist uh, archaeologies and interpretative archaeologies uh, uh, criticized exactly uh, from this point. So th this is a, well, very simplified way of how, how we think in archaeology, at, at least how I think about the word explanation and are they simple or complex? Thank you. Yeah, no, that's 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 really helpful. Yeah, it's always really interesting um, when you've got a sort of philosophical education to see which philosophers have been picked up by different scientific communities. Um, I mean, one thing that's that I really love about Hempel's influence over the processualists is that at least it's not Popper. Um, like, um, I mean, I actually have, I actually quite like Popper. There's lots of good things to say about him, but he's the usual sort of go-to philosopher. And it's really interesting that Hempel gets picked up. And partly I think it's because, um, some of those, you know, people who are sort of shaping that have, are actually are pretty sophisticated in lots of different ways. What's kind of really interesting as well is the way in which, as you've just nicely articulated, Alexander, terms like explanation come to symbolize particular things within, um, uh, different disciplines. And so one that I run up against quite often is historians. Some, some, some sort of genre of historians will sometimes say that historians don't really give explanations because explanations are causal. Um, and his, historian, historical explanations are not causal because they're kind of psychological somehow. Um, most historians don't say this any now, anymore, of course, because historians don't give psychological explanations anymore. But <laughs> that was a view that was actually pretty popular um, you know, maybe 20, 30 years ago, which from my perspective is completely wild because I'm not sure why causal explanation, why psychological explanations aren't causal. I'm also not sure why some that is required for something to be an explanation. And what's going on, of course, is also in history, you had an influence, I think, for, I think it was, I think it was from Hempel, um, which led explanation to be tied to this law like stuff. And this is something you see in the philosophy of history as well, right? I sort of mentioned this in the discussion. I'll come around to archaeology in a second. But in the philosophy of history, you'll often find still people writing papers where they go, okay, there's Hempel. <laughs> and then there's this other stuff. And from the perspective of a philosopher of science, it's like, can we please stop talking about Hempel? That was like, oh, that was like 100, well, not 100 years ago. It was like 80, 70, 80 years ago. We've done stuff since then. <laughs> um, and it's, and it's, you know, and it's interesting that um, these things get picked up in these kind of wild ways. And so it's, yeah, and so in archaeology, um, I guess one way of taking your point, Alexander, is that my question is difficult to answer because when I say, do you take what you're doing to be driven by explanation, the sort of way that that's translated is, are you a processualist? <laughs> Which, of course, is not at all what I mean, <laughs> right? Because I think that, I mean, certainly post processualists give explanations all the bloody time. They're just different kind of they, they have different rules about what counts as a good explanation perhaps than um a more sort of standard processualist has i'd also be interested in hearing more about this um because something I've, i'm always suspicious of uh, the people who the people who you should be you should always be suspicious of people doing their own history right um philosophers in particular right philosophers are terrible at doing their own history never trust anything a philosopher says about history particularly the history of philosophy um, but it's always, always find the way that archaeologists sort of um, do this kind of uh, what to me almost has to be mythologizing, right? There's this idea that, oh, well, prior to processualism, all that archaeologists were doing was making lists of pots. That was all you did in archaeology. Um, it's like that. Surely that's not right. <laughs> surely prior to um, you know, you find similar things in paleobiology, like, oh, prior to the 1970s, all paleontologists did was help geologists organize their strata. They didn't think about, like, you know, paleobiology in any sense. It's like, it's like surely, surely there were some places where they were doing that. Surely there are exceptions to those kinds of rules. So I guess um, I, I, I like... I mean, Alison Wiley's the last person we're talking to. She'll be here in week seven, and she has a lot of really nice stuff to say about these crisis debates, as they're called, in archaeology. Um, and it'll be interesting to sort of get her opinion on the ways in which sort of philosophical ideas kind of get picked up 
and then carried along <laughs> on these like weird um, uh, 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 kind of um, crisis debates. I mean, maybe one final thing I'll say is as someone who's like read lots and lots and lots of sort of different scientific papers, I tend to think that you can tell that the um, scientists have kind of run out of ideas um, when they start throwing philosophers at each other. Like once one scientist starts saying that the other scientist isn't, you know, being a proper Popperian or something, then they've, they, they no longer have a productive dispute. <laughs> oh yeah, Stasha. Uh, it's not directly related to the paper that we were discussing today, but it's very much related to the last five minutes of your talk. Uh, how archeologists pick their favorite philosophers and how Hempel got into archaeology. And this is particularly why I'm so grateful for this opportunity to uh, listen to the people from other disciplines discuss my own discipline. It's always very useful to have that outsider's view on what you're doing. And uh, it's really kind of an ex exciting way of doing things, of thinking about things. How the hell did Hempel get into archaeology? Well, one insider who was there for the processional revolution in the, in the 60s, um, gave an explanation that it was simply because at that time when Binford was trying out new solutions, a very um, concise, very well organized and very popular edition of Hempel's work was published and he came across it. So it's quite often it's a chance. And sometimes it simply is uh, a philosopher that is uh, attractive enough, that is uh, simple enough for the people from the outside to understand and then it gets applied. And uh, that's probably the thing that happens in archaeology quite often, that some influences from philosophy enter the field of archaeology because they are stylish at the moment. But sometimes it does give a very good result. It's that it does give very good results. So that's just about that whole story about interdisciplinarity and how we borrow ideas from another field and how we incorporate it in, our, in ours. And I'm very grateful for Slobodan, uh, for Alison Wiley, sorry, who, uh, who, who directed me towards uh, Galliston and trading zones, which is a very important uh, concept, I think, for all of us sitting here to, uh, in all those lectures of yours so it, it's just a comment it's not it's it's not a question but maybe it gives you some food for thought yeah no i mean i absolutely adore um explanations that go oh there was no real reason <laughs> it just happened <laughs> um you know i think that um those those sorts of explanations um i i i they, they make me very happy um and it's not sort of surprising i mean one thing that i find interesting that i would like to sort of get a bit of handle on at some point is um the difference ways and like philosophers tend to think about philosophy in very weird ways <laughs> that are kind of different to how scientists tend to think about philosophy in the sense that um what's what we're putting it my uh, i'm making gross generalizations here right but quite often the sense i get is that scientists care about philosophers in extremely pragmatic ways right so um hey like this thing what hempel said lets me have some kind of story about what i'm doing and that story works well for me so i'm going with it um uh and you know it doesn't matter too much if the details aren't kind of right and Hempel keeps saying weird things about like <laughs> probability that i'm just not going to care about who cares you know um so, so there's a very sort of casual i guess which isn't to say not deep right like it's kind of it's not as if they're not meaningfully engaging with this philosophical work it's just that they're not doing it the way a philosopher would which brings back around to this really interesting feature of interdisciplinarity right is that um there's this interesting thing where i think part of doing good interdisciplinary work is kind of letting your own disciplinary hangups kind of relax, but not in a way that means that you kind of lose the good bits of those disciplinary hangups. And so for me, it's always really interesting learning how to um, come at these philosophical ideas. I don't, I'm not saying I'm good at it, by the way, I'm learning how to do this, come at philosophical ideas such that I can see what might be valuable about them to the scientist who's engaging with them because the temptation and this happens in every direction all the time is to start you know philosopher splaining or to have you know archaeologists will start archaeology splaining things to me where I'm like oh yeah okay no I get that and sometimes it's really useful to have someone say here's how it looks in our discipline um, but the worry is to not pretend that you own it <laughs> right and so there's this real 
real interesting sort of um, psychological slash epistemic challenge with interdisciplinarity, which is to do with letting things be really have really have sort of multiple meanings and have really different purposes because from the perspective of the philosophy of science i would be very happy if we never discussed Hempel ever again um because uh um the account uh, now looks extremely naive um uh you know <laughs> i'm sure it's in about 10 years someone will write some Hempel was right after all paper or something but you know generally speaking it looks it's very very outdated but that doesn't mean that he can't be doing really useful work in other sorts of places when you think about things in a different kind of way um and so i'm always kind of <laughs> having that kind of difficulty in both directions right because when i try and do work on things like paleontology and archaeology i'm forever sort of bumping up against the rules of paleontology and archaeology which as an outsider i don't know as well as i could <laughs> and maybe can't know right in the right ways well that, that reminds me of a session that was uh, organized some seven eight years ago on a theoretical archaeology group, and the title the, se the title of the session was "Have we become second-rate philosophers?" Because archaeologists have had enough of borrowing all kind of posh philosophical stuff, and people thought it was suffocating the discipline. So yes, there is a danger of um, shop uh, window shopping without really understanding what we are trying to do. But on the other hand, we can't make it without borrowing from other disciplines. Yeah, it's an interesting, like, I've not thought very much about theoretical archaeology um, as having that kind of what I call sort of methodologically omnivorous kind of uh, aspect to it. But of course, um, it does, right? One of the things that one of the reasons why I find theoretical archaeology so incredibly difficult is because there are so many like ideas just kind of flying around at this like, you know, with kind of almost almost reckless abandon, which is like really um, coming in as a philosophy like, why, what? <laughs> like, it takes, it's really, it's really interesting. Um, now you think, make me love it even more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's again, like, I think the next time I'm discussing theoretical archaeology, I should try and remind myself that. Um, and maybe that'll let me relax <laughs> to it. Don't worry, you're great at it. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind. <laughs> so we still have sort of 10 minutes left. Um, I know this has been sort of, I think, perhaps one of these discussions where um, uh, there's been a lot of information and that makes people very uh, find it difficult to sort of ask questions. Um, but I do want to and so I'm not, you know, I'm not going to drag out the last 10 minutes, but I'm going to pause and just see if there are any other questions people want to ask things they want clarification on things like that. Cool. Okay. So it sounds like um, people have got enough in their brains right now, but thank you for letting me run through that. Like that was genuinely helpful to me because I've not really known how to think about the relationship between Max and Maya's paper. Um, I'm guessing that Thursday is actually going to be really, really interesting. It's going to be one of those cases where I suspect if there are things you were confused about today, you're going to be either, either you will come away much less confused um, but with some like really interesting new questions, or you'll come away more confused, but hopefully in a productive way. <laughs> so thank you for indulging me in this very sort of <laughs> inside baseball kind of thing. And um, I'll see you all on Thursday. <laughs>